sharing the screen. And so can you see the slides now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so first, uh, apologies. Uh, last time when I tried to do the screen recording, I forgot to um, turn on the microphone or select the microphone. So it was, I think last week there was a silent. So hopefully it will be better this time. Okay. Um, So this is, well, um, this week and the lecture I'm gonna talk about uh, task abstraction. I'm gonna, but we're gonna do a quick review of what did last week first. Okay, and the last week uh, we first covered um, data visualization. So first we introduced what data version, what we mean by data visualization. <coughs> Excuse me. And so there's a few important things. And so it's aimed to augment or improve human capabilities rather than say replace people and with a purely computational decision-making methods. Also, um, a second thing is to replace and cognition with perception. So instead of you having to remember everything in your mind or try to imagine what it looks like, it shows you visually so you can focus on the reasoning part. That's the, and replace cognition with perception. And the reason we pick say visual systems instead of other systems, for example, and sound or smell or taste or touch. And is because the visual system has much higher bandwidth compared to the other senses. And so it can processing lots of data in parallel and some of these are can be done pre-attentively um, in the sense you don't have even to go to the brain. So it's kind of hardwired detection. Okay, and uh, so we also mentioned to say a visualization designed for one task can be worked very well, but if you change the task, uh, that may not work well at all or work much worse. And so this is actually what we're going to look into a bit more today is look at and what are the different possible tasks. And then later on, we're going to see for different types of data, how do we design for different type of tasks? Okay, and uh, finally, we also mentioned different kinds of limitations that you can have when you try to visualizing the data. And so the first is the limitation of the computers. So limitation in terms of how much data it can store, how much data it can, and how fast it can process, how much it can hold in memory. And the second one is in terms of display. And that's the limitations of how much you can show on a screen. And finally, that's the limitation comes from the human. Actually human and how much information it can be can understand or comprehend at the same time. And so usually a human is the most limiting factor. We said roughly human can only see about a few hundred, several hundreds or maybe up to a thousand items in one display at the most. And beyond that, and it would not be able to kind of make sense for uh, say understanding of each individual items, maybe overall that's okay. So usually, and um, how to design to fit best with the human is most limiting factors. And because in the real world, the data set is usually much larger than say a few hundred or thousand items. I can also say almost, you can hardly find data sets smaller than a few hundred data, uh, data set. And how do you visualize, visualize them effectively to make the work? And is one of the things we need to learn, I will learn in this module. And okay, and now that comes to the lots of different definitions related to the data set. So related to data. So we have these different types. Uh, I'm gonna go through them here again. So hopefully it will make more sense later on when we talk about different types of data and how to visualize them. 
And so first we have the data types. So we have five. These are the items, attributes, links, positions, and the grids. I think, uh, and these different date types and forms data set types. So the data set types will be the tables, the network, the field, uh, and also a geometry and cluster. But we don't have geometry in here, but we don't have a, uh, I say, an example of cluster. So the tables is made up of the attributes, which is one of these, and then the items. Uh, so the attributes are the columns, and the items are the rows. And then the network is made up of the items, which is called nodes, and the links, which connect us the items. And then we have the fields. We're probably just going to go skip this one because that's not something we'll cover in much detail. And then the, finally, the geometry. Again, it has items, which is a dot, but it also has a positions, which is another type of data. So most common one will be things like the maps. Excuse me. So, and, and finally, we talked about attribute. So the attribute is one of the data types and it's first divided into an categorical and ordered. So categorical means you can say they are different, but you cannot say which one is bigger or smaller or before or after the other one. So by definition, it does not have a natural order. So the shape is one example shown here. You have different shapes, uh, the cross, the circle, the square, and triangle. So these shapes, you can say the shape is the same or different, but you cannot say one shape is before or after, or bigger or larger, or bigger or smaller than the other. And can anyone think of other uh, categorical attributes? Anyone? No? Hi, Carl, it's Chief. Can we say uh, numbers? Um, numbers is not quite a categorical. So yeah. numbers is actually later on very much quantitative where you can compare side and say, compare which one's bigger and smaller. And also yeah. you can do computation. So that actually falls into quantitative. What about colors? Yeah, very good. Color is one a good example of categorical. So you can say different colors, but you can't really say, say which one is before or after. And uh, I assume, I guess you can add one color to another, but that's not computational. You just make like a mixing color, make a new one. So color will be a good one. Okay. Uh, well done. So we're going to, ah, so we're going to already mention this one already. We have the ordered type of attributes as well. So we have the ordinal, which is the ones which you can have orders you can say which one is before or after or you can compare say so what's shown here is the dress size you have small medium large then you definitely can have an order and you can see which one is bigger and which one is smaller but you cannot do any computation and um, so you can't just use small size and plus a medium size that doesn't really give you any meaningful answers and uh, so finally is the Okay, can anyone think of any ordinal attribute besides size shown here? Anyone? No? Yeah, I think it's quite difficult. Actually, I couldn't quite think of anything now. Uh, that is also ordinal. I'm going to mention that if we came across it later. And so uh, the last type will be the quantitative one. And so here it shows essentially the length of the line segment. So you can certainly say which one is longer and which one is shorter. But you can also do computations. You can add one length to another that give you a larger length. So that's called quantitative. 
Okay, I didn't quite mention this part. So as I mentioned, so this is lots of different concepts and can get, what do I say, a slightly confusing, um, but hopefully as we go on, it gets close, actually become clearer and clearer. And so to say the data set was probably the large, the, like the top of the hierarchy. And then for the further breakdown into different data types and one of the data type, which is attributes and further breakdown into the categorical and ordered. Okay, and uh, for this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about the analysis framework, which is the, the like the general way how we think about when we try to create a visualization. And then we're going to talk, talk about the first part uh, of the analysis framework, which is called task abstraction. Okay. And the analysis framework itself is quite simple and it contains what, why, and how. And so it kind of forces you to think about when you design something or create a new validation. So usually when you create a validation, you'll be given a data set, sometimes potentially some analysis task, and the job is to create a validation that can solve, provide answers to the task. And this framework and kind of force you to think about all three parts as important to create the validation. Uh, so, and think of like uh, this is this is square here as the all possible validations you can do, and these each say the square cross or circles are the say different possible solutions and so what this shown here is you really want to be open-minded and start to consider about all possible solutions and gradually narrow down and in that case you are more likely to find the optimal solution which is this final circle in the middle here but if you come with kind of an additional constraints or your own bias or sometimes even called just to say you just start with a kind of something in mind you think it has to be visualized this way and you will still be able to further improve or narrow down options and but you may not necessarily in the end find the best solutions because you start with a quite limited space to start with you might miss the and good solution already <clears throat> okay and so essentially the analysis framework is trying to get you to do it this way so you start with kind of the faintest of light, faintest blue circle to consider all the possible solutions or way or designs validation and gradually narrow down bit by bit depends on the what why and then decide how to choose the how okay and so you're going to see this and quite often later on as well just to help you to remember the analysis framework and so we actually already covered the what part and it is just to say what is the data so it's talk about different data types data set types and attribute types okay and then the why is just the task so why do you want to visualize what do you want to show what the user needs to see from the data set that's the why and since this in other term is called task abstraction well, which is what we will discuss today and uh, finally it's the how so how is actually how do you turn the data into visualization? How do you represent the data, different attributes, using colors, shapes, or size to represent? So this is what we will cover in the uh, remaining of the lecture. Sorry, the in the future, in other in the following lectures. So there will be some general guidelines to say how do you design the visualization depends on the what and the why. So it depends on the data and depends on the task.
And so this is what we just seen before. So it covers, this is to tell you, this is already covers the, the what part. So it's talk about different types of the data, data set and attributes. So these will be used later on to help you choose the design for your validation. And so this is a similar diagram, uh, which we're going to cover today. And it's the why. And there's quite a few of these. So it divides into two main parts. One is about action in terms of what user to need to do. And the other part is about targets, is what the things you need to find out from the data set. And we're going to go into much more details later on. And then <clears throat> this is the how. Uh, so again, you have two main parts. So we will cover these in much more details in the future lectures. But roughly on this side is about they call the visual encoding or sometimes called visual, visual mapping. Uh, the general idea is how do you map a data? For example, it's a quantitative attributes map from that attributes into, say, a color or size or shape. And what will be the good way to do and depends on the data and analysis. And there's also the other part. A uh, lot of this is actually related to interaction. And for example, you can have changing the data, you're selecting data, or you're navigating, essentially see different parts of data. And there's also part about how do you use multiple views to show and the data to achieve the, re the better results, fit better for the analysis um, task. And finally, this is again more about interaction. You can use and filter or aggregate as mostly for large data sets. And we talked about when you have too many data items, if you show them all together, it might not be helpful. So it's actually better, for example, you only show part of the data or you show an aggregated view of the data, not showing all the details and provide the details later on depends on user interaction. And so, uh, so these will account for most of the lectures we cover. So we're gonna cover the and what last week and we're going to cover why today and the rest lecture for the data validation part will be mostly covering the how and now we go need to talk about the task action abstraction part and uh, as you've seen before uh, if i can go back so this is the why part which is this part of the uh, this framework. Okay, and before we get into the details of different types of tasks, um, we just want to briefly talk about uh, why analyze task uh, abstractly. So here, so the abstractly means you do not consider the task and in a domain specific way. Okay, so an app example will be an abstract ta task might be, and you want to get an overview of the data. So that's an abstract form in the sense, it's not depends on type of data. You can get overview of the data in a table or you get overview of the data on a map. It doesn't matter. They also, they both are considering an overview and also it's independent of the specific domain of the data. So you don't really care if the data is about and COVID cases or is the data about say the products in the supermarket. They are both overview tasks that's independent from the domain. Okay, and so this is important because for example, the different type of data uh, they may have similarities and differences just depends on the type of data then this abstraction allows you to focus on the parts which are common across different domains and it, it currently ignores the part which are domain specific for example the COVID data may have certain properties 
which does not exist in the say supermarket the product catalog but we ignore those part we just focus on okay what is needed for an overview regardless of the data types okay and so if we don't abstract uh, don't think about this abstractly then you might have too many different cases you have to deal with for example you have overview again overview you can have supermarkets and the covid cases and many other possible like public health record or phone call record or social media there's too many different um, cases and it was difficult to come up with say or to cover each of them separately <clears throat> And also, actually, there are a lot of similarities, even when you have different domains. And so that's why we consider the tasks abstractly here. OK, uh, so if you remember, so this was kind of like the left half of the entire picture or the diagram about the Y. So this is talk about um, the type of actions that user will do. And um, so these are in general code actions, and it's kind of like a hierarchy, even though it's not quite break drawn like a hierarchy. At the top level, um, you can choose um, what kind of analyze user is doing. So the analyze could be uh, two ways, and either consume data or produce data and so I guess produce is maybe easier to start with is something you something new you will create and using the visualization whereas consume is you look at some visualization other people's created which is completely fine and and then under the consume oh sorry uh, we're going to not talk about the under the consume these further breakdown yet. We're going to cover that in the next few slides. Okay, so once you decide for the top level, it's consume or produce, and then you will have the middle level, which is the search. And so it doesn't matter whether you consume or produce, most likely you will involve some kind of a search. So there's two possible um, aspects of the search. And so the first aspect is about the target and whether you know what you're looking for or not. So that's why you have these two columns. So this is a situation where you know what you're looking for. And for example, you are looking for a specific, okay, you're looking for a specific product in the supermarket catalog. And so then you know what you're looking for. And then sometimes you don't really know what you're looking for, for example, you want to looking for, let's say the product making the most loss in your catalog, then you don't know what that is yet. And then you have to, so that means that's the situation where the target is unknown. Okay, and the other aspect uh, is about whether you know where the item is. And this is in terms of where, in terms of the actual visualization. So sometimes you don't know where that it will be, and sometimes you know. And for example, let's say you are looking for the product that makes the low most loss among all the products you have. What you could do, and you could sort the entire product uh, list by the profit they make, and then you know the one with the least profit or most loss will be at either end, either depends on how you sort it. If you sort it uh, from the smallest to largest, then that's probably the one on the top. And in that case, the location will be known. Okay, I'm gonna come, we're gonna talk more about this again later. Okay, and finally, and once you find something up from the search, you might do identify, compare, or summarize. And because Say so identify it individual, but when you search for something, it doesn't have to be a single thing. It could be a couple of two things or multiple things. So that's why the compare and summarize comes in.
Okay. And uh, so the last thing is, and these are the three levels, they're all independent. And in the sense, a user might do a consume, but then this, this does not affect which type of search will be involved and does not affect which type of query will be involved. Yeah, all this, you can freely combine any options from the analyze search and the query. Okay, and uh, finally, and the reasons is we probably want to do this kind of analysis beforehand so we can pick the correct uh, validation for the specific analyze search and query task. Okay, so now we're gonna start with this part and look a little bit more into different uh, kind of button level under the consume and produce. So we start with consume. As I said, this, um, that's a form where you look at the visualization rather than say creating new visualization. So it might be slightly confusing, but for example, and if you create a validation say in Tableau or spreadsheet and then look at it, and even though you creating the visualization itself is still considered as consume. Uh, okay, and so if there's any questions, it's not so clear or I didn't really make it explain it properly, just let me know so I can stop and uh, try to maybe give some examples or spend a bit more time on it. I know, and these things can be a bit abstract at the moment, and hopefully, and later on we will have some examples so will make it a bit easier to understand. Okay, and it depends on the purpose of consume, and uh, you can have three general categories, and the one is discover, so discover is the phase where you're actually trying to find answers from the data set. So that's usually for under discover. And then you also have present. And so the present is when you actually already find the answers. You want to communicate to someone else, say what the answer is. For example, you already done your analysis. You find the uh, results and you write a report. And then you have to say, talk to your boss or manager to say, this is what I've done. And you can use validation to present your results. So that's different in the sense you already know the results. You just try to communicate to someone else. Okay, and enjoy is again, a bit different in the sense it's much more, usually in a much more relaxed setting. You're not really trying to do some analysis as part of a job. You just find it interesting. It's a topic you're interested in. And let's say you are interested in football, and then you might look at some visualizations showing the statistics from say a football team like Liverpool. And in that sense, you're not particularly doing any analysis on data sets or present any results to someone else. It's just purely for your personal enjoyment. So that's also possible kind of type of analysis. Okay, and in terms of discovery, you try to find new things that you don't know before. Uh, so it could be just say by chance and something you just happen to see, which you did not quite expect. Or sometimes it could be, you know, something is, and you know, something might exist in the data set and you try to find them. So again, they will be slightly different. And so this type of the serendipitous in terms of just basically means by chance is slightly harder to design because you really don't know what you're going to find. And so you really just try and through try and error. Whereas for example, this one, you have some ideas and you might be better able to design the violation to discover this. So maybe an example here would be say, you might suspect that there's a correlation between the weight of car and their fuel consumption. So maybe the hypothesis will be say, the heavier the car, the less fuel efficient it will be. And you know that's the, so the correlation is what you want to looking for and you know what attributes 
is involved, which are the fuel efficiency and weight. And then you can design your visualizations to show this type of uh, correlation. Whereas if you don't have that kind of in mind, then it's more or belong to this part. Okay. And so in terms of uh, the difference, as I already said, in the serendipitous and observation or discovery, and you don't really have hypothesis. And the role of the visualization is to help you to generate a hypothesis. And this is actually quite important part of using data visualization. And there's a lot of cases. And for example, you know, as uh, there's problem with certain, with, you know, there's, for example, oh, what would be a good example. And you know the general things you want to achieve. For example, you want to help the company and improve their profit. But you don't know exactly what the problem is. So you have to first find out what the potential issues are. Then you have to look at the violations, which hopefully can give you some clues to help you generate hypotheses. And the second part um, is more about and verify or confirm existing hypotheses. So this could be something, or the hypothesis could be something you already have in mind before you start, or could be go through this part where you use a visualization to generate some hypothesis that you can confirm later. Okay, uh, so present, it's really about say, communicate the information to someone else visually. And if you say, Sometimes people will be, instead of using just one image, they might try to tell a story with data, for example, with multiple images, or guide you through a series, cognitive, a series of and visualizations. And I'm gonna see some examples later on. And so this is very common, used in, say, decision-making, planning, forecasting, and, and instructional process. Essentially, when, you, when you're not just working on data yourself, you're communicating with someone. <clears throat> okay. And usually, because you already know what you want to talk about, want to show in the validation, so it's usually very specific. And uh, you should already know what the answer is. And okay. And so, and this is one of the examples. And uh, this is commonly called infographics. And have you everyone, have anyone heard of this before? Uh, okay, so Tommy said yes, uh, but most of you seems haven't. And essentially, so, and one thing that's quite unique to infographics is usually, and they try to tell a story, and but using uh, static images. And it just say present some things usually about a particular topic and using graphics, not just numbers. For example, these are the say some numbers here. And but it's just not just using numbers and text, but using kind of shape, color to represent the meaning and use different charts and put them together. And so this is kind of visualization and mostly designed to present or communicate certain information you know exactly want to you won't know exactly what the result or the outcome is and you know the message that you want to tell the people looking at the validation so that you would design a particular way to get your message across so this example here is just a generic uh, and infographics example it's not on the particular topic so the actual numbers or text there doesn't really mean anything Okay, and uh, the last one is the enjoy. As I said, this is not usually not for work or business purposes. It just says for something for your own amusement, something you are interested in. So you're not really drawing by sort of verify or generate a hypothesis, but really you're just curious. You want to learn about something or a topic that you're interested in. Okay, so looking at infographics could be potentially an enjoyment, for example, it's a uh, infographics about football or cars or any topics you're interested in, and you spend a bit more time on it, and that's not really for any work, it's just because you want to learn more about that topic. Uh, 
And okay. And so, and this is one of the examples of enjoyment. And this particular realization, it has a name and called Name Voyager. And has anyone seen this before? Can you click? No. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, uh, okay, it seems most people haven't heard that before. Uh, and so it's actually relatively simple. And what it shows is the, it shows the popularity of the names over time. And so you can see at the bottom, and it shows from the 1880s to 1890s, all the way to 2012. And above, you can see the different names. So we're gonna actually talk about this kind of particular violation later on as well. But you can see, uh, I'm not sure if you can see, and this blue one here, it takes a bit small, and it says Oscar. So that means the popularity, how tall or how wide that particularly strand or stripe strand is, shows the popularity of the name at a particular time. And so you can see for this particular name, which is Oscar, it was quite popular in the 1880s. I mean, lots of baby was named Oscar when they're born. And you can see over time, these ones goes down and somehow it becomes the least popular in the 1960s and then becomes a bit more popular again. Uh, also, for example, you can see here, and again, maybe the actual name is too small. It actually says Olive. That's the name becomes very popular in the, and start become much popular uh, recently, so after 2000s or 2010s, it becomes much more popular. And then there's also two other things. And here the blue indicates the name for boys and the red indicates name for girls. And then finally, you can filter the names. Actually, you can here actually choose and you want both only boy or girl names. And you can just type in O, that means I only want names start with O. So that's why you only see the name with O here. I can actually open the live realization. Okay, it's loading now. Let me see if we can make it bigger. Okay, so that's exactly the visualization we saw before, but this is where it's uh, in the original state when the name is not filtered. So it shows all the names over time and it shows both the boys and the girls name, not just one. And <clears throat> okay, and then you can probably already see by mouse over one of these, uh, you can highlight a particular name. So that one, it says John is the most popular man's name in the 1880s. I assume it ranks in the 1880s one, that means that's the most popular. Obviously over time it becomes less popular. So you can say, I only want to show girl's name. And okay, you can then you can obviously see, for example, Mary was very popular, but not anymore. And you can also pick a particular name, for example, I would say, let's choose all the names, start with A, and it's a girl name. And this is what it looks like over time. So it looks like Anna or Annie, Agnes or Alice, very popular. Uh, there's this, a period, say Amanda, become very popular, or Amber. And most recently, it's the Abba or uh, you can find it here, Abigail or the variations of different Abigails. <clears throat> and so I want to show this is as example of this for the enjoy purpose. And really there's nothing too serious you can say about uh, these names and the trends, how they change over time. But people obviously very interesting. This and spend lots of time on this and lots of online discussions about this as well. 
So that's one of the examples of what the day and purpose for the consumption of the consume is enjoy. Okay. And so that covers the the consume part, and then we come to the produce part. And uh, in a sense, and uh, it's creating new information or new data. So just by creating the visualization itself, it's not considered as produce, but only when you add something which was not initially in the data, and they were considered the produce. Where's my mom? Um, excuse me. So, um, for example, you can have something you discovered in the process when you look at data visually, and you want to record that, and that becomes the produce. Okay, and so the first one is just annotate. And um, for example, and you had the visualization, and you present some data, and you have a finding, say Turkey is losing money. So you might add this information onto the map itself. So it becomes a part of the validation. So that is considered annotate. And certain things you link to, point to a part of the validation and it's produced. And because this information is not originally in the data. So in this sense, it's, you are producing new information and being added to the data and that's regarded as produce. Okay. Uh, so the record, and in this sense, is save or capture visualization as a uh, as kind of, so uh, hopefully, oh, okay. So the, Easiest example is just taking a screenshot. So you might find something interesting, like if you think this and visualization is interesting, and you take a screenshot of it or save the state of the visualization at that part at that time. So that is treated as record. Essentially, you create a new saving of visualization states which does not exist before. Okay, and uh, so an examples of this and record and um, is called a graphical history. And essentially it um, remembers a different state of the software that is in. And so this is actually kind of an experiment did on Tableau. So you can actually see at the bottom, it shows a series of screenshots of the state of Tableau. So you might start with the actual data and then you choose to create a bar chart. And then you might change the bar chart settings. Now, instead of two, you have one. And finally, you add more uh, information or data to the bar chart and have different series. So you can capture each of these steps as a, as a screenshot. And that's the record, the, the visualization states, and then becomes a produce some new information. Okay, and uh, finally, there's the derive. Derive means um, you create something new based on the existing data you have. And in this case, um, you not produce a screenshot annotations, and but some new um, data, for example, statistics. Uh, okay, so for example, uh, in your data, you might have a attribute, it's called water temperature, and then it might be recorded in degrees. So the water temperature may be 20 degrees, 10 degrees, or five degrees, but you can potentially change this into something hot, warm, or cold, depends on how you define it. So you might say, okay, if anything is above 25 degrees, it's hot, between 10 and 15, 10, 10 and 25 degrees is warm, and below that will be cold. Then this 
hot, warm, and cold values are the new values you added into the data set, which does not exist before, and that is regarded as the row. And similarly, you can also say, for example, you have city names in your data attributes, and you can change that into to, or translate that into longitude and latitude. Again, it's a different type of data which does not exist before. And again, I can show you another simple example here. And so let's say in the original data, you have two columns, like for each country, so you might have the amount of exports and the amount of the imports and how that changes over time. So these are the original data. And what you might do is you can actually look at the difference between the two, which give you the trade balance. That's the derived data. So that is something which does not exist in the data before, but the derived data, which is the trade balance, and maybe more relevant to the analysis talks you, you at, and you have at hand. So this might be a more useful realization to show the people um, for your analysis. And okay. Uh, so that covers the the top part, which is the consume and the produce, which is, is in general analysis. And can I get just a general, a quick feedback just to see, I mean, am I going too fast or too slow or? Uh, no, no, I think well, that was no. not going too fast. That's why I say that. No. Okay, okay. It thinks it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I can imagine, say, the things is still a little bit abstract here. Um, but uh, that's the nature of the first part. We have to introduce all these different concepts. And then we can get into the maybe more practical, interesting part of actually creating these relations. Um, okay. Uh, let's. Oh, and also. Do we want to have a quick break now? I realize we're already more than halfway through. Can we again sh see a show of hands? Do we want to have five minutes break? Okay, it looks like everyone wants to. Let's have a five minute break and we come back at, uh, let me see what's the time now. Okay, now it's 2.21, we come back at 2.25, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Great. Thank you. See you. Okay. Let me see how do I stop the recording.